Gospel of Mark. Just kidding. <laughs> Force a habit. No, no, just, just joke. Go ahead and turn your Bible to the book of Psalms, chapter 46. If you don't know how to find the book of Psalms, take your Bible and about midway through, just crack it open there and you're almost there. All right, it's right in the middle, and uh, Psalm 46 is towards the, probably the first third of the book of Psalms. We're doing something different with this series than we were in Mark. Mark is a different type of text. When you read and you study Scripture, it's important to know there are different genres of literature within the Scripture. Today we're looking at poetry, really. We would say the Psalms are songs. We understand that. They were sang by the Jewish people. But we don't have the music, right? So a song without music is basically poetry. And so we're we're looking at poetry. Now when you look at poetry, you'll see things like hyperbole. You see uh, allegory. You see euphemisms. There's all sorts of artistic ways the writer uses to prove their point. It's not like the apocalyptic or prophetic writing that you find in the Bible, even though that does use some metaphor and some euphemism and things like that as well. That's different. You approach it with a different attitude. When you understand it's something prophetic, you're, you're reading it looking forward through the lens of Christ. When you read prophecy or, sorry, poetry or song, you're looking at worship through the lens of Christ. And then when we look at the narrative, you know, like Genesis or the book of Acts or the Gospels like Mark, that is telling a story that is leading us to Christ. In a sense, Christ is the the whole Bible is about Christ, right? We understand that. And so when you're reading a narrative, you're reading a story, you're reading about something historical and how a character goes from point A to point B. In fact, the Bible has some very awesome, very powerful character development within it. If you've ever read the story of Joseph, Joseph goes from a young man who brags about his big dreams to his brothers and gets humbled, sold into slavery, becomes second uh, only to Pharaoh eventually. And there's this whole thing. And and rather than being... uh, Angry at his brothers rather than carrying the grudge, he forgives them. He weeps over them and he loves them. It takes, that's a big change in Joseph's life when you really dig in and understand his story. The character development of David. He goes from being this lowly shepherd, this youngest brother. And, and uh, Am I too loud? Oh, Mike was shaking his ear. I thought, I'm too loud. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> and he threw me all the way off, Mike. Good job. Um, now someone else is doing it. All right. I don't know what that is. Maybe you guys need a Q-tip. Um, but but we, when we're looking at the, all right, enough's enough, all you guys doing. When you look at the genres of the Bible, it's important to understand. When you look at parables, for example, to understand that the person is telling a story for a purpose. When you look at wisdom literature like Job and Proverbs, you read it understanding that. That this is giving you wisdom from God. And all of these are historical in some way, and all of these point us to Christ. But today we understand we're looking at poetry. We're looking at um, I don't like to say an artistic way because everybody then thinks artistic license or something like that. But it's a, it's a very interesting, a different perspective, a different way of describing God. That's what Psalm 46 really is. In fact, this psalm, there was this German preacher who wrote a whole song about this psalm. And if Sylvia Kale were here today, she would correct my German. But it was titled this initially, Ein feste Berg ist unser Gott. Anybody know what that is? A mighty fortress is our God. And of course, the German preacher was none other than Martin Luther, who this week we celebrate Reformation Day. If you don't want to call it Halloween, October 31st is the kickoff for the Reformation, where he nailed his 95 theses to the door in Wittenberg, Germany, the church door. And Martin Luther chooses the perfect way to describe God based off of this psalm. He calls him a fortress. He's not some fortress like the castles you see in Great Britain or Scotland where they're so big and and bulky and they have moss and ivy crawling up one side and walls caving in on the other. 
God is a good fortress, a solid fortress. He is a, a battlement that we fight from. He's a mighty fortress that we can run to, that we can hope in, that we can trust in His power, in His, in his providence, and in His presence. In fact, God alone is the Christian's fortress. This world has nothing to offer us. But God is our fortress in our most chaotic, most confusing times. And more than that, He's a fortress that provides us care. It's not just a, a, a place of war, but a place of healing. If you have your Bible open, let's read beginning in verse 1. Actually, right before verse 1. For the choir director of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth, a song. Verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth should change, and though the mountains shake into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its lofty pride, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, and she will not be shaken. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations roar, the kingdoms shake. He gives his voice, the earth melts. Yahweh of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come, behold the works of Yahweh, who has appointed desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts up the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Yahweh of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. That's beautiful. Church, I said Martin Luther said it best. He is our fortress. And for many of us, it is time to return to the fortress. No matter how far you've gone, no matter what you've done, it is time to return to the fortress. Time to remember the strength and the stability that we find in our God. It's time to remember that when there's chaos in the world around us, when there's confusion in our, in our governments, in the world around us, when there's everything else falling apart, there is true care within that fortress. Now we read this, and this is a, a, a song written by the sons of Korah. They actually wrote 11 of the 150 psalms. Who is Korah? Well, he was a rebel. He was a bad guy in Scripture, really. I mean, not really, but really. In Numbers 16, he is someone who opposes Moses. He, he rallies about 250 other leaders of Israel together, and their attitude of of their rebellion is, who does Moses think he is? I mean, he is the guy that just kind of led you across dry land in the middle of a sea. He is the guy who was bringing plagues to Egypt. But it's not enough for Korah. He's clearly, Moses is clearly the man God has chosen to lead Israel. Big deal. You see, Korah's attitude was, we're all a holy people. We're the people of God. He's a Levite too. He comes from the same tribe as Moses. So who does Moses really think he is? A tr Jewish tradition tells us that Korah was a rich man on his own, which I find incredibly interesting considering they all just came out of slavery. But somehow Korah must have done well for himself. And so he, he's a self-important person. He thinks he's above God's design for his people. And so he comes after Moses and he gets all these people rallied together. Now ultimately Korah and all his supporters, God's not going to have that. So the earth opens up and they're swallowed and they fall to their deaths. Now most people, when something like that happens to a relative, especially an ancestor, what do they do? They become bitter. They become angry. Do you know what happened to my ancestors? You don't know what happened to my ancestors? It becomes this battle of who suffered the most sometimes, right? My ancestors are Irish. I don't want to hear any complaining. Right? If you don't know the history there, 
you'd read a book. But, uh, <laughs> but the descendants of Korah, they know this happens to him. In fact, it comes out in the text. And it doesn't make them resent Yahweh. In fact, it drives them to worship. It drives them to writing, like I said, 11 different psalms. Because they understand God is just. And God is good. And if Korah is their ancestor and he suffered because of a decision he made, Korah probably deserved it. One reason, I always caution people when they come to me and they say, I just wish God would deal with that person. I wish God would deal with all the wicked people. I almost always kind of take a stand back because what if he starts with them? Right? What if he starts with me? We all have sin. We all have wickedness. We have to be careful with that. Instead, it, when God does deal with people like that, we should be driven to worship. The sons of Korah did that. They got back to a proper understanding of who God is, and it led them to worship. And when we understand what they're writing, what they're telling us, that God is a fortress, it draws us to worship. The first thing we should notice is he's our fortress in the chaos, we read again in verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. He's our refuge. Well, the Hebrew there is pretty self-explanatory. He's our shelter in a time of danger. That's what that means. The psalmist says that basically what he's, what he's getting at here is God is sufficiently able to protect his own people. And in fact, he expects them to to expect his protection. He wants them to want him. He wants them to need him and come to him as that refuge. A few years ago, many people were quoting Psalm 91 to me. They were saying, Pastor, we need, we need you to preach on Psalm 91. When you read Psalm 91, you can understand why. It talks about God protecting you amidst a plague. COVID was happening, right? A lot of confusion, a lot of bad things were happening, a lot of riots were going on. Pastor, do this. I did a whole study, verse by verse, on our YouTube channel. If you're ever bored and need a nap, it's, it's still up there. We did a whole study through it. And when you read it, Psalm 91 begins. It says, I will say to Yahweh, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And it goes on, it says, He will cover you with His pinions, and under His wings you will take refuge. His truth is a large shield and bulwark. But the problem is, when you read Psalm 91, the first half of that psalm is all about God protects you from His own wrath, from His own judgment. You see, the people of Israel were, were trailing off, as they often did in the Old Testament. And God was saying, but if you stay faithful to me, when I bring disaster upon the people of Israel, I'll keep you safe. That's not what Psalm 46 is saying. Psalm 46 is very different. Psalm 46 is saying that in a world of chaos, in a world full of evil men and evil things, God is our fortress. He is our refuge. And He's not only our refuge, He's our strength. He's our protection. And not only that, the very next line says, He is a very present help. And I'm just going to stop right there for a second. Very present. That word very in the Hebrew means he is powerfully present. By saying he's present, it means he's reachable. He's there. And he's present tense. He is a very present help. In other words, God is here. God is here with us. God is here now and He is attainable. He's someone who you can go to even in this very moment when you're struggling, when you're afraid, when you're stressed, when you're worried. He's there. That's the emphasis. He's a protection now amid all our trouble. And the trouble, by the way, is plural in the Hebrew. Because how many of you have more than one trouble? I do. I've got text messages right before the service of things going on in my family and stuff like that. I have more than one problem, believe it or not. Pastor Jeff doesn't have it all together either all the time. 
The word literally, the troubles there, it means anxieties, stresses, needs. Who doesn't have a few of those? No matter how many troubles we have, in spite of them, he is very present. He's not just standing there, present. He's not just standing off to the side, chewing bubble gum. Hey, looks like you got a lot of problems there, buddy. That's not God. No, he's a present help. He's active. He's there. In fact, one of the, one of the names of the Holy Spirit is he's our helper. He comes along beside us. He gives us aid. He drives us. He pushes us on. In fact, Jesus is that type of friend that the Holy Spirit draws us to. He's that friend that Proverbs speaks of, Proverbs 18, 24. A man of too many friends comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. That's the God we serve. Jesus told his disciples in John, he said, I no longer call you slaves, I call you friends. He's the kind of friend, the intimate companion who guides us. And there's a whole list of these if you want to put them up, Calvin. He's the type of friend who guides, Psalm 119, 105, who comforts, 2 Corinthians 1, 4, who is reliable, who loves us, who chooses us, who rescues us, who justifies us, who sanctifies us. I guarantee you don't have a friend who does all those things. You might have a friend who loves you. You might have a friend who supports you. You might even have a friend who would lay down their life and take a bullet for you. But God is even better than that. Because before he called you friend, he laid his life down for you. Before you even knew you were a sinner, Christ died for you. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's what Paul tells us in Romans 5.8. In him we find that love. In him we find that friend. God is not a friend who's seasonal. He is always there. As often as we need him. And then some. In any affliction, any problem, any pain, he is a very present help in anything that might cause you trouble or distress or anxiety or worry. He is there. It's Christ Jesus who, who is God, who is that refuge for us. And our souls fly to him for safety. Psalm 9, 9 says, Yahweh also will be a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of distress. We are to see him as a fortress. And therefore, verse 2 says, because he's this, because he's this great thing, therefore, we will not fear. We will not fear. Though the earth should change and though the mountains shake into the heart of the sea, we don't fear. Even if the earth should change actually means if it's removed. In other words, it, and it's not talking about planet earth here. It's talking about the very ground beneath your feet. If it should be yanked out from underneath you. Well, where do we see that happening in Scripture? Number 16. Korah's rebellion. The very earth is yanked out from beneath him. And yet, and he, as he continues to fall, continues in his heart of rebellion. But the sons of Korah say, but even if this were to happen to you by some other way, God is still a fortress for you. God is still a sanctuary for you. He's still your strength. He's still very present. And because of who he is, if you are in him, you have no need, no reason, no obligation to have any fear in your heart or, or in your mind. In other words, if God truly is who he says he is, we are free to be who he tells us we are. We are his children. We're the sheep of his pasture. We are joint heirs with Christ. And we have a place within the fortress. Nothing changes that. Not even should the ground beneath our feet disappear. Even if that happens, fear has no place in the heart of a Christian. And even if the mountains, you ever think about this, the mountains are the most stable thing in the earth. They're just big rocks. It takes months and months, if not years, to move a mountain with a bulldozer. 
They, they are the one geographical feature that is completely unchanging, right? And yet, even if they should have fear, even if they should fall into the sea, the chaos of the sea, even then, the Christian looks on and says, I'm not afraid, though. I'm not scared. Though its waters roar and foam, the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its lofty pride, the mountains are afraid. The chaos becomes so great. The chaos in your life becomes so loud that it roars and it hisses and it foams and it froths, even to the point that the most stable thing in all of geography begins to teeter and totter. We need not fear. We need not worry. The mountains may tremble. We don't. We stand within that fortress. We stand with our God. He's very present. He's always there. He's always ready. He does not shrink from a fight. I absolutely, this isn't even in my notes, but I'm going to gripe for just a second if you'll allow me. I hate pictures of a weak Jesus. The second commandment, by the way, says we really shouldn't even have pictures of Jesus. But don't draw him as some weak, sissified hippie. He's a warrior. Our God is a fighter. And the next time he comes, he's not coming like this, guys. He's coming with a sword in his hand on a white horse. And he's going to make war against all evil. Against the Antichrist and his minions. That's how Moses describes him. In Exodus 15, this is how Moses, who just led the people of Israel through the Red Sea, this is what he says, Yahweh is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will extol him. Yahweh is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. Through Christ, we are able to see God as our rescuer, our savior, to see him as our warrior who fights for us. These mountains, you know, whatever you think is stable in your life, whether it's your marriage, your job, your friends, your family, they may be the most stable thing, but they can be devastated. They can turn on us. They can be lost to us. They can abandon us. One family reunion, my great uncle Carl goes to my mom. My mom and dad have been married for 20 years. My mom was the only person in her family at that point who had not been divorced. In fact, I have an old family picture of all of my mom's side of the family. And aside from me, my cousin Justin, whose first wife died, and my uncle Todd, out of about 15 people standing there, everybody else has been divorced at this point. My uncle Carl goes to my mom at this family reunion and he says, you know, Kathy, I think you're the only woman in this family who knows how to keep her man. Some of you wonder where I get my bluntness or curtness. It's <laughs> the next year, my mom left my dad on Father's Day, 2000. One of the most stable things in our family was my parents' marriage. But if people actually knew how unstable it was. There are many people who have a lot invested in their home, in their bank account. But I promise you, whatever these stable things are, whatever the most stable thing you have in this earth, it will face adversity at some point. God is the only one who faces that adversity and says, don't fear, don't worry, rely on me. Even when those stable things quake in our lives, when the pride of the chaos of our enemy smirks and taunts and flaunts at us his meager victories, even still, God stands by his throne with his hand out inviting us, trust me one more time. Return to the fortress. Run to the fortress. No matter where you are, no matter how far you've gotten, he is waiting for you. Even in a world that is driven in chaos, he's our fortress in the center of it all. And more than that, he's our fortress in confusion. You know, a lot of things are confusing in this world. I mentioned 2020 a few minutes ago. I remember a time where we were told, make sure you wipe down all surfaces and your doorknobs because the virus can be transmitted that way. Remember that? 
And about a week later, hey, don't worry about wiping everything down anymore. Right? We still have hand sanitizer every five feet you walk. But don't worry about that. That's not how the virus transmits. Wear a mask. Oh, wait, masks don't work. But you should still wear a mask. Don't wear a mask. Masks are dumb. Nope, masks are stylish. You should wear them anyway. Very confusing time, wasn't it? And somehow we were supposed to just go along with everything, even though we didn't know anything. That's confusion. And I'll tell you right now, I, I know many pastors whose churches folded, flopped. Pastors who've given up on ministry because of all of that stuff. And I can tell you, my advice to them is the same to you. Find the fortress. Go back and stand on the word of God. Verse, six, verse 4 says, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. You know, we look at this psalm and we don't know exactly when it was written. In fact, in Hebrew, there's no word for grandson. So when it says sons of Korah, it could just be descendants of Korah. We don't know exactly the time in which it was penned. But it had to have been at a time where Israel or probably even Jerusalem was facing adversity. Many scholars think it's, it was written around the time of Hezekiah in 2 Kings 18 when, when Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, encircles the city. And he sends in this guy and this guy talks the most epic trash you'll ever read in scripture. And he tells these people that their God's not going to save them. All these other gods couldn't save them. And he dares them to pray to their God because it's not going to help them. They might as well just surrender now. Hezekiah prays. And the prophet Isaiah comes to him and he says, don't even worry about this guy. God's got this. God has it all under control, Hezekiah. And supernaturally, that enemy flees. And God deals with them and saves the city. And that's where they think this psalm originally comes from. That's our God. That's our rescuer. That's our fortress. We look at this idea of the city of God. There's this river. And we're just going to stop there for a second. It says there is a city. That's present tense. The city cannot be the literal Jerusalem. It can't be. Jerusalem has no river that springs out of it has some rivers that flow around it, but no river even flowing through it. And remember the genre we're looking at. This is poetry. This is a song. And just like the mountains and the seas are metaphorical, they're allegorical, so is this river. This river rep represents something. And it's present tense. It's a river that flows. And church, I want to tell you right now, in this moment, it's flowing. It's flowing forth from this room. It's flowing forth from... This church, his church, wherever the believers gather together, says this river makes glad the city of God. What could that possibly be? Do you remember the kids' song? I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors, sets the captives free. I've got a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up, oh well, within my soul. That's, this, is the, this is the river he's talking about. The river is his grace, his peace, whose streams, plural. His streams, they're in abundant supply. They bring love, joy, peace. All those sweet fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit operating within the believer. That's the river flowing out of us into the world around us. In the psalmist day, it might have been the tabernacle in the midst of the camp, in the, or it might have been the temple in the middle of Jerusalem flowing outward. But now, through Christ, through His death and His resurrection, it's now flowing through His Holy Spirit as it flows out of His church. You see, the holy dwelling place of God is here now. It's within us, within those who give their lives to Him as the Holy Spirit dwells within us. As the Spirit resides inside us. Paul says to the Corinthians, he says, Do you not know your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? When we come together, church, when we come together, what's a city? A city is a community of people, a gathering of people. 
That's what the church is. We're that city when we come together. He makes his presence known. Isaiah says, The mighty one, Yahweh, will be for us a place of rivers and wide canals on which no boat with oars will go. Why? Because it's not a literal river. It's a stream of God's presence flowing out of us. His river flows from us, from within us. And this peaceful river is a sharp contrast to the roaring waves of verse 3. Why? Because God is here with us, in us, with his church. You see, when the rest of the world falls into chaos and the rest of the world falls into confusion and your friends and your, your unbelieving loved ones, they're all panicking and they say, what is wrong with you? Why aren't you scared? You can say, because I have a fortress. I know who my God is. I'm in Christ, and Christ is within me. And the Apostle Paul tells me, the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. Guard me? That sounds like a protective thing, kind of like a fortress. When we understand that we are, through Christ and in Christ, we are God's people. We are God's city It's not limited to some territory. This promise that was made to Israel is good for us. We are that new Jerusalem, Revelation 22 promises. We are grafted in through Christ. And God says through Zechariah about that time in the future, it will be in that day the living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and half towards the western sea. It will be in the summer as well as the winter. The head of the river is the heart of God. And the fruit of His Spirit flows through us from His heart into the world around us. And that is the river. That's the way to understand that. But that city, verse 5, God is in the midst of her. She will not be shaken. God will help her when morning dawns. You know, at one point in church history, the church itself was often referred to as the city of God. You know, the sad thing is now we're not a city as much as a township. Right? In fact, you go to some places, they're not even a township. They're like three guys living in a cardboard box. But wouldn't it be a beautiful thing to be the city of God once again? Where it's, where it's not a building, but it's a gathering of Christians and those in the community around it look at it and say, that's a place, that's a community of God. That place is a blessing. To be the city of God within the city of Lisbon, Wouldn't that be amazing? Well, the earth may change, the mountains may slip, the sea may roar, the hills quake. This city doesn't shake. This city doesn't falter. It's not moved because God is within her and his presence flows like a river. His holiness flows through his church. Not a man-centered holiness, not a forced holiness. Those things only breed stress, anxiety, fear, and insecurity. But when we learn to rest in Him, in His presence, His Spirit flows in us and through us and out of us. True holiness brings peace. It brings satisfaction. It brings joy. Those streams make the city glad because heaven resides within us, because God resides within us. We're that city. We are under His protection. Like I said, in Christ, we are the new Jerusalem now. The old Jerusalem had fortified walls. And you know why the people kept falling into sin? It's because they trusted more in those walls than they did in what was going on in the temple. They trusted more in the walls than in the Lord Himself. And their prophets tried to tell them this. Joel 3, 16, Yahweh roars from Zion and gives forth his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earthquake, but Yahweh is a refuge for his people and a strong defense to the sons of Israel. Zephaniah says, God has has taken away his judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The king of Israel is in your midst. Yahweh is his name. You will fear evil no more. It was true of Jerusalem then. It was true for God's people now. Some people like to see this and hear this. They say, well, that was actually for the nation of Israel. It's not for us. But what it does is reveal God's heart for those who are in him. No matter where they are, no matter when they are, no matter who they are, 
as long as they are in Christ, his son. The psalmist proclaims God will help her when morning dawns. It doesn't mean God's time is restricted to the morning. It means he's there at first light. He's there at the earliest possible time. It comes in the early morning when we need it. It may not seem like God is always rushing to our aid. It doesn't always seem like God is quick to answer my prayer or quick to do what I want. But his timing is always perfect. 2 Peter 3 9 says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some consider slowness, but is patient. God is very patient. God knows what he's doing, he's God. And he's not ignorant of what attacks you or what tries to steal your joy or, or come after to fight, for, fight against you. He's ready instead to fight for you. The psalmist in Psalm 121 says, Behold, he who keeps Israel will not slumber and will not sleep. In fact, he's ready to go. I sometimes picture God as a father. I dare you to pick on my kid. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Because he will avenge us. He is our avenger, not Captain America, right? Not Thor or Iron Man or any of those other guys. He's the one who fights for us. And that's why Paul tells us in Romans 12 let him do his job, let him be the one who takes revenge. And he's quoting Deuteronomy 32, where God says, Vengeance is mine, and retribution. In due time their foot will stumble, for the day of their disaster is near, and the impending things are hastening upon them. In other words, God is watching out for you. God will take care of those who strike you, who come against you. Therefore, like verse 2 says, we will not fear. Verse 6 says, The nations roar, the kingdoms shake, he gives his voice, the earth melts. The confusion in the kingdoms of the earth is not a problem for the fortress that's God. Our governments may come together and rattle their spears and, and kingdoms might rise and kingdoms fall. But if God so much raises His voice, they all melt. They all fall away. The King James says the heathen raged. The Hebrew word there refers to pagan nations and unsafe peoples. The nations whose God is not the Lord. Yet Psalm 33, 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is Yahweh, the people whom he has chosen for his inheritance. You understand the whole world may rise up against the church, the true church, and try to confound or confuse. But when God thunders his voice, they're done. Their game is over. They may shout, they may grandstand, but when he booms, he dissolves them. He actually, the, the Hebrew word, he melts them to nothing. Verse 7 is identical to verse 11, but it says, Yahweh of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Yahweh of hosts, sometimes that's translated as Lord of armies. Hey, if, if my God has armies, I'm not afraid of China who has one army. Right? I'm not afraid of Russia or Canada or whoever would try to invade. I don't have to worry about that. He's the God of armies. In verse 11, we see the, the same word, like I said. But the application is when we who are in Christ are under the banner of God, when we've embraced His fatherly love, we are those whom He cherishes. He's with us. You think about that. He's with us. That's very personal. He tells us how personal He is. In Psalm 24, which we're going, to do, we're going to be in next week, it says, Who is this King of glory? Yahweh, strong and mighty. Mighty in battle, lift up your heads, O gates, and lift, up, lift yourselves up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is He, this King of glory? Yahweh of hosts, He is the King of glory. That King is with us. In fact, that's one of His names, Emmanuel, when Isaiah prophesies that Jesus will be born. She'll call his name Emmanuel, God with us. You understand God's people can enjoy his protection because he's there. He's present. He's reachable. He truly is our fortress. And, and not just a fortress for battle, but a fortress for healing. He's a, our fortress in care. Verse 8 says, Come, behold the works of Yahweh, who has appointed desolations in the earth. 
Well, you read that and you say, he's appointed desolations. That does not seem very caring, Pastor Jeff. But you understand first, this verse is an invitation. He says, come. He's welcoming us. He said, gather to me. Come to me. Not, not me, Pastor Jeff. He said, come to God. Come to the Lord. See what he has done. Behold his deeds. He brings peace to people. He destroys the desolations. He destroys the weapons of the earth. He has appointed such desolations. The word desolations is a horror. It's an atrocious event that brings to waste. That's what happens to those who reject the Lord rather than seek shelter within him. That's what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. In the book of Genesis, this is what happens to Israel's enemies in the land of Canaan. And this is what happened to Korah, uh, number 16. The ground that was under them split open and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up. You see, that's why it begins with an invitation that the invited not become one of the desolated like the ancestors who wrote the, of the people who wrote this psalm. The message the psalmist is sending to the reader is that men choose to hope in themselves and not in God, because they are indifferent to his works. So look at his desolations. Look at what he's done. Or they're so ungrateful for the good things he's done, they don't consider him as they ought to. But the invitation still stands for any who would trust in him. Any who would come to him. There have been desolations. There will continue to be desolations. But the emphasis for the believer, for the one who is willing to entrust their life in that fortress of God, they're protected. When I say they're protected, that's not to say they're safe. You know, a fortress is built to undergo a siege. A fortress is a place of battle. It's a place of warfare. It's not a call to safety and comfort, but it is a call to security. Jesus said no one may snatch us out of his hand. A fortress may protect you, but it's also a place you fight from. This is Mr. Beaver in the Chronicles of Narnia talking about Aslan, who's an allegory for Christ. He says, he's not safe, but he's good. A fortress is not a safe place, but it's good. It's protection. It's a place of war. It's a place of battle. It's a place for a fight. And God does fight back. Verse 9 says that he makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts up the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. You know, it's not a treaty that ends a war. It's not a ceasefire. It's God's sovereignty that ends the battle. When Jesus was born, Isaiah prophesied, a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And his peace is without end. Verse 9 in our text today is also prophetic. But it's also applicable even here and now. We know, Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon formed against us shall what? Prosper. Every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the inheritance of the slaves of Yahweh, and their righteousness is from me, declares the Lord. But there's coming a time where all war will cease. Every battle will end, because God is going to put an end to it for good. Ezekiel 38, or sorry, 39, verses 8 through 9, it promises a time where the nations will burn their weapons of war. Isaiah promises a time in Isaiah 2.4 where they will hammer their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. That day will come. But until that day happens, verse 10, cease striving. God is speaking here. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. That is God interjecting into this song, into this poetry, speaking for himself through the psalmist. He says, cease striving. And we read that, we think, stop, right? Stop fighting. But really it means to let go, to release. In fact, if, you'll under, if you hear this, it can even mean relax. Relax. And know that he's God. 
Relax and know that He is God, not you, not me. You know, this isn't in my notes either, but one of the things I learned from more mature pastors very early on, I'm so grateful for. I used to preach my first year, and if there was no response at the altar call, I would be depressed the rest of the week. Man, I must have really bombed. Man, that was bad. I used to think, man, if, if I'm preaching this and people just aren't getting it, or, or maybe, maybe I'm the problem here. And, and I had a pastor take me aside one time, and he said, you got to relax. You know what, Jeff? He said, you're not the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you that is probably the most liberating thing everybody, anybody, anybody has ever told me in ministry? You don't have to be the Holy Spirit for your church, Jeff. You don't have to be God. You can, you can let him do his job and just, you just do yours. And then he quoted 1 Samuel. He said, and then if the people reject the message and you've, you've given them the word, if they reject it, it's not on you, it's on them. Just like how he told Samuel, it's not you they rejected, it's me. This microphone's acting up, so... I must be really preaching good now. We don't have to be the Holy Spirit in our life. He does that job. We can relax. I don't have to worry about it. The battle is the Lord's. The world is going to be ran how He wants to run it. It's His show. It's His church. It's not mine to control. I have to be a good steward of what He gives me. But that's as far as it goes. Let God do His thing. Preach the Word and relax, Jeff. Go out, share the Gospel, and let it take root. You don't have to force somebody, manipulate somebody, or goad somebody into saying a prayer with you or anything like that. Just give them the truth and let the Holy Spirit cook, as they say. Let Him work. Let God do His thing and relax. Paul writes, We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. And we love to quote that when we're sick. We love to quote that when things are going wrong. But even when things seem to be going right, it's still true. It's for His purpose. Not mine. Not yours. His. When the Christian says, I'm just letting go and letting God. I heard somebody say, oh, I hate when Christians say that. Why? Why? You know, they're not... They're not saying, I'm too good to deal with this. They're not saying, this is too small a thing. It's not worth my time. They're saying, I know my limits, but I serve a limitless God who has control over everything. He's sovereign, and I'm going to trust Him to make everything right. I'm letting go and letting Him just take it. That's a good thing. That's what God says to do. Cease striving. Let go of it. Let me deal with it. It's acknowledging that He's God. We're not. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a moment of strength and humility. It's recognizing He's sovereign. I'm not. He says He'll be exalted among the nations. He'll be exalted in the earth. And again, this is prophetic. The Apostle Paul says at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Church, if you are anxious about what you see on social media or the news, if you're worried about today, if you're nervous about tomorrow, I would plead with you, stop, relax, release it, cease striving, and know that He is God. And He is good. And he's faithful to his word. And he will be exalted. It doesn't matter the battle. He wins every time. Read the book. We might lose here. We may not win here. We may suffer here. This is true. But read the book. Read the end. We win every time. We win where it matters. We win where it matters. Because we have found the fortress who is God who matters. In Revelation, seven times to the churches of of Asia, he says this, he says, to him who overcomes. Paul says we are more than overcomers. Revelation 8.37, or sorry, Romans 8.37, he says, in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. 
through our fortress. The word conquer, you've seen this word, and it's a Greek word, and the word overcome, it's the same Greek word. We overwhelmingly overcome would actually be the, the, maybe the better way to read this. You've seen that word. You go into fo- Foot Locker, you watch football this afternoon, you'll see, I promise you, it's Nike. It's actually pronounced Nike. But when Paul writes overwhelmingly conquer, he created an entirely original Greek word, hypernikomen. It means be overwhelmingly overcome. That's who we are because we're in the fortress, because we've got Him, because we're in Him. Verse 11, and I'll begin to wrap this up. Yahweh of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. And I know this is identical to verse 7, but before we close, I just want to point this one thing out. The word stronghold in the Hebrew is the word miskav. And it means he is our high point. He is our high ground. He's the high ground, the safe place, the advantage point. He is our rallying point. He's not a place to whimper and hide as though we're cowards. He's the rallying point we fight from. He's the fortress we find shelter in that we might live to fight another day. We may need healing in his hands. We may need rest in his presence. We may need replenished in his word. But it's only so that we can return to the battle and cry out once more, the God of armies is with us. And this battle is the Lord's. We are more than conquerors. We have the high ground. We have the good fortress. We are on the winning side. Yahweh of hosts is with us. I'm going to ask the music team to come back up. I mentioned to begin this message, I mentioned Martin Luther, who wrote, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. The story behind that is in 1525, 1527, the bubonic plague was spreading again as these viruses tend to do, made a comeback. And it was spreading through Germany, and a lot of people were dying. And and Luther had to decide, like so many of his reformer friends, he had to decide if he was going to stay in Germany or if he was going to leave and go somewhere safe. And it's not because he didn't want to move or because he was stubborn, but Luther stayed because he was called, he believed, to pastor the people. And because he stayed to pastor the people, his own son was dying from the bubonic plague. And at night, Luther would sit by his bedside every night while he was recovering and while he was sick, and he would meditate on Psalm 46. And it was there he began to write the words of that beautiful hymn, A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate on earth is not as equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Does ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is He. Lord Sabbath, His name, from age to age the same, and He must win this battle. And though the world, the, though this world with devils filled, should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his true and triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, the tremble we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them, abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him, who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. It's beautiful. We call it Psalm 46, but it's an invitation to the fortress. And there's one word at the end of every stanza, if you noticed it in your Bible, it's S-E-L-A-H, Selah. And it means to pause and meditate on what you just heard. Today, as we close in song, if you will stand with us, we're going to close in a song of worship. But I would ask you, during this song, 
I would challenge you, meditate on what you heard. Meditate on the scripture. Think about what God is saying. What he's saying to you today. Maybe maybe you're stressed. Maybe you're worried. Maybe you're living in fear. Then it's time to return to the fortress. Maybe you're sitting here. Maybe you're watching online. You're saying, is he even my fortress? I don't know. Do I rest in him? Do I resist him? Which one is it? Well, it's time to return to the fortress this morning. Let's worship together.